Hi everyone, I'm Janice. I'm the adult programming librarian here at the Erlinger Branch Library. I want to welcome everyone um, to our presentation this evening. Uh, before we begin, I do want to mention a few upcoming programs. On Saturday, we have our annual Yield Days Fair. It's like a Renaissance Festival style event. We're going to be having um, the Cincinnati Opera Express, the NKY Fencing Academy, Raptors Inc., Pony Rides, hopefully, if the weather holds, <laughs> and a bunch of other uh, vendors and artisans are going to be here as well, along with some food trucks if you get hungry. I do want to mention that this is part of our Oktoberfest series here. Uh, we do have these flyers in the back uh, on that table back there. Our next one is going to be the Cincinnati German Heritage presentation, and that's going to be done by the Cincinnati Museum Speaker Bureau. So without further ado, we're going to get to the main course here, and I want to present uh, Stephen Hampton. He's the executive director of the Brewery District Community Urban Redevelopment Corporation, and that's quite a mouthful, but uh, we are presenting live here um, on Spectrum Channel 200 and Cincinnati Bell Fiber Channel 819. And hello, everyone out there in TV land, and hello, Stephen Hampton. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here to talk a little bit about Cincinnati's brewing heritage, and it's not just Cincinnati, but the entire region. Um, uh, I am the director of the Brewery District Community Urban Redevelopment Corporation, and we are a neighborhood nonprofit that is based in Over the Rhine, the north half of Over the Rhine, that focuses on neighborhood redevelopment by utilizing our brewing heritage. It's an amazing asset that we have still, uh, and it's a very powerful way to help redevelop a neighborhood that's been very neglected for a very long time. But I'm going to talk a little bit about our history, some of the architecture, kind of what happened over the years, and a little bit about what we're doing to kind of preserve and promote that that history so Cincinnati was one of the biggest brewing centers in the country uh, we brewed a lot of beer we brewed a lot of really good beer we drank a lot of beer um, and it was part and parcel of almost every spa every aspect of our city and our region's culture not just in the city of Cincinnati but northern Kentucky and, and really throughout the region uh, Cincinnati beer was really known as almost a brand name Cincinnati beer was was known as a symbol of beer quality uh, throughout the world but like every story in Cincinnati, it starts at the riverfront. So the first commercial breweries were located on the riverfront in the early days of the city. Um, Davis Embry was about 1811, 1812. There might have been one or two before then uh, that were actually commercial breweries. But even before then, people were home brewing on the, in the, uh, on the farmsteads uh, in some of the pubs uh, in, in a very preliminary way. Or they would have had their beer shipped down the river uh, from the East Coast. Um, early beers were, were typically porters, um, ales, uh, and stouts. This was typical of the time. Um, lager beer wasn't introduced to America yet. Uh, it was uh, the English, Irish, and French brewers that were the first ones over here. These were the styles that they were familiar with. So these typically tend to be a little bit more hearty, a little bit uh, full body, a little bit more alcohol, and that's what the style was. Of course, there was a lot of other uh, alcohol at those days. Uh, water wasn't the best, so a lot of spirits and whiskeys and, and ciders and things like that, but beer was pretty popular. And so what really changed beer, not only in America, but especially in Cincinnati, was the introduction of lager beer. And I'll talk a little bit more about the process, but um, it was the fact that it was brought over here by Germans, it was loved by Germans, uh, but it required a very unique way to produce that beer. And so uh, when we had these large waves of German immigrants, um, the area that was available for them to settle in in Cincinnati was the area that we now know as over the Rhine. And it was north of the canal, the uh, Miami and Erie Canal. And as you look at this old map, you can kind of see we've got this relatively flat part of the city surrounded by these, our fabled seven hills of Cincinnati. And that was where they settled. And those hills became very important um, in terms of producing that beer. 
I'll come back to all that when I talk a little bit about the architecture. Um, but again, in those days, you didn't really drink at home like you do now. Your, your life was spent in the uh, bars and saloons and hilltop resorts and uh, social uh, organizations uh, like the Turners and singing societies and church societies. Uh, most people lived in tenement housing very densely. In over the Rhine alone in the late 1800s, about 44,000 people lived in about 360 acres. It was the second most densely populated neighborhood outside of lower Manhattan. And they didn't have living rooms. That's basically they lived in one or two room apartments. And so they spent all their time in these other locations. And beer was that kind of social lubricant that, that went around them. Um, inclines uh, opened up a whole new wave of unique opportunities with the hilltop resorts. We had five inclines in Cincinnati. Four of them had hilltop resorts. These were massive entertainment complexes uh, where people could get out of the dirt and smog and noise and tight quarters of the basin to get some fresh air and a beer on a on a Saturday or I'm sorry on a Sunday afternoon. They're one day off a week. Uh, that also started to eventually unlock other development. But those hilltop resorts in their prime uh, often serve more beer than. Uh, the entire uh, thousands of bars down in, in the, the basin. And so, as I mentioned, uh, kind of laying this out, we liked our beer. Uh, Cincinnatians, especially those German American Cincinnatians, drank a lot. Over 40 gallons of beer, which was two and a half times the national average. That was 40 gallons for every person uh, in the city. Um, those Germans, when they brought uh, when they came over in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, they brought their love of lager beer. And that lager beer is, again, what drove all of this uh, production and consumption. So drinking all that beer, uh, we needed a lot of places to make that beer. Uh, by 1870, uh, uh, 18 of the 36 breweries in the entire region were in OTR alone. Um, and they range from big, massive breweries to small, little regional breweries. Um, and I kind of skipped over the fact of how Over the Rhine got its name. Um, mentioned all those Germans. Uh, a lot of them, again, they settled. Uh, OTR was where a lot of them were able to settle. In fact, it was, uh, it was so German. There were, there were so many uh, German immigrants or children of German immigrants, uh, about 75% of the population of the neighborhood by the late 1800s uh, consisted of German-speaking peoples, and so they brought their language and culture and customs. German language was taught in the schools. Um, it was spoken at the business, around the saloons. That's, uh, that literally was this little Germany, so they joked that you were crossing the Rhine River, the, the Miami Nary Canal, into this little Germany, and that name has uh, stuck ever since. But Again, they made, uh, Germans made really good lager beer. And as we moved into this lager beer period, it was primarily German brewers who brought that skill and that uh, quality uh, to America. And, and some of the names you'll recognize and some of them passed on. So this is what we basically call the brewery district today. Generally, it's the north half of Over the Rhine, the West End, north of Liberty Street. And that's where the majority of these breweries were located. Um, over time, there were kind of breweries in different places downtown, but as development increased, this is where they, they ended up in that kind of period from 1850 to Prohibition is where most of these breweries are located. So you can see Central Parkway, which was the Miami Area Canal, Liberty Street, McMicken Avenue, and right in the, the center there was Finley Market. And so you'll see a lot of them were along McMicken, along the base of the hill, or along the, the canal, along which is now Central Parkway. Um, we still have this amazing collection of these breweries still remaining. Um, and I'm going to walk you through a couple of these to show you kind of the variety and the history that we can still see in the actual buildings that we still have here. And so the Lafayette Brewery is on uh, uh, West McMicken, just west of Vine Street. It's one of the earlier breweries. Um, started uh, by uh, Frederick Billiards. He was a Frenchman. Uh, he had partnered in an earlier brewery uh, closer towards the jail uh, in the courthouse, uh, but started this brewery here in uh, 1836, so pretty early on in the, in the period. Again, this was before Lager Beer. He had a little beer garden uh, uh, in the area next to the brewery. Uh, he was a Frenchman. He named his uh, brewery after the Marquis de Lafayette, the, of course, the, 
the, the French hero, the, the revolution. Um, and he made, he made uh, ales and, and different beers there. And it was, a, it was a great story about that. There's actually a portrait of him. They just uh, restored at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And there's an image of his early brewery that burnt down before they rebuilt it with this one. Uh, but they would actually sell the beer by the pound. Um, you would get your, your big pitcher, your mug filled, and, and they'd weigh it. And, and that's how they'd actually sell the beer by the pound. They'll often do that today. But you can see, even with this brewery, even though it was uh, replaced an earlier wooden one, very simple construction. Uh, not a lot of uh, adornment to it, very simple, even very typical of the other industrial or factory buildings of the time. So nothing to really set it apart that it was a brewery, uh, and the fact that they were making beer inside, and you probably would have smelled what they were doing inside. This is another brewery. Uh, a lot of these breweries had multiple names and ownership. And so, uh, you, you know, you may know a brewery by a certain name and maybe other people may know it by another name. And it gets a little confusing sometimes when people say there were 100 breweries at one point in Cincinnati. Um, that's not quite right. If you add up every single brewery that existed, we had 100, uh, but we never quite had 100 all at the same time. Again, at its peak, there were about a little over three dozen breweries, which is still a pretty amazing concentration. Um, this brewery, again, uh, a little early. Uh, it was an assemblage. Of the, the brewery grew over time. But one of the great things that this brewery starts to tell us is some of the things that you can't necessarily see from the street. And so there's actually cellars and a tunnel underneath the street connecting these different parts of the breweries. And there's a lot of different pieces around that. I'll come back to the cellars when I get to another brewery. But tunnels were uh, a very important part of brewing in an urban neighborhood. Um, it was very tight, uh, it was very built up, you couldn't always build right next to you, but there were also tax laws uh, that drove what you could do with your beer. And so uh, early on, beer was brewed, put in a keg and sent out to the saloon. They would tap it at the saloon uh, and serve you the beer there. That was it. They didn't have bottled beer. They didn't have canned beer. Didn't go home with you. Um, that was really how it came out. And so when they started taxing beer, it was taxed by the barrel. Well, uh, as home consumption became more important and bottling beer became more important uh, in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, but the tax law said you had to keg your beer, take it across the public right of way into another building before you could bottle it. Not very efficient. And so Congress came to the brewer's rescue in 1890 and changed the law, though, as Congress has wanted to do. They didn't make it really easy. They just, you couldn't just bottle your beer in the brewery now, but you could have a pipeline or a tunnel connecting your brew house to your bottling house. And so we started to see around that time period a lot of tunnels connecting this. So uh, this brewery has a very small tunnel. It's just about six feet high. You can kind of see in the image in the bottom right there that connects it. It would have been lined with pipes uh, that would connect the brew house with the bottling work so they could produce that bottled beer and, and ship it out for home consumption. You'll see a little bit of the cellar images. Again, I'll come back to some of that in a, a, another brewery. Um, another great example is that these breweries, you know, changed over time. Uh, the, as technology advanced, as the breweries grow and changed, uh, they added buildings and, and, and converted buildings. So uh, what you see even in this Sanborn map from the 1860s is not what there is, uh, is there now. So the buildings on the right are actually wagon sheds and stables that were eventually replaced by a more modern bottling works. So you've probably heard of this brewery, the Hootapult Brewery. Um, Hudapult was uh, an interesting story. He was actually one of the first American-born brewers uh, of great import. So uh, most of those German brewers uh, were actually immigrants. They came over here as young men uh, and, and started these breweries uh, and worked very hard to do that. Uh, Ludwig uh, Hudapult uh, was actually the, uh, the son uh, of immigrants, and he uh, started originally uh, owning a liquor store with apartment, George Cotty. Eventually, they sold that, bought into an existing brewery, the Kohler Brewery, also known as the Buckeye Brewery. Uh, and then uh, George died, Hudapult went on his own, uh, and grew this brewery into a, a pretty good-sized brewery. He actually passed around the turn of the century, but his family continued that on. They were one of the few Cincinnati breweries to survive under their original ownership through Prohibition, and they survived up until uh, 1988 um, on their own, merged with Shaneling, another great Cincinnati brewery in 88, 
were sold to Alton owners in the late 90s, but have been returned to local ownership under the new Christian Moorline Brewing Company. It's a little, you got to have a lot of map and diagrams to track all this. But so that's a brand that's been continuously made since 1888. Uh, and of course, you, you know, uh, you see that name still around, uh, at least for a little while longer on the smokestack over in Queensgate. So this is a great piece of trivia, at least while it's still standing. Ask people where the original Hootapult Brewery is. Most people are going to go, oh, you know where that smokestack is over in Queensgate next to 75. That was actually their second plant. After they started in OTR, uh, right on East McMick and actually around the corner uh, from where they're currently produced. Um, uh, and then after Prohibition, bought a second plant, the uh, Lackman Brewery uh, over in Queensgate, operated two plants up until the 1950s. And so uh, next time you, you need to win a, a beer at your bar bet, you know, that, that's your piece of trivia. But there's still some great details. This is the Bottling Works built in 1911. You can see there's this great mosaic of the logo on the floor. There's actually still some tanks in the bottom of that building. Another brewery you've probably uh, heard of, the Christian Moorline Brewery. So Christian Moorline is pretty much the archetype of Cincinnati brewers. Uh, he was the biggest and best. He immigrated over here as a young man from Tupac, Germany. Uh, he had learned the brewing trade a little bit, but he was also a blacksmith. And he immigrated over here with a few dollars in his pocket, uh, worked his way to Cincinnati, digging ditches, doing blacksmithing work, uh, again, just laboring and, and putting a few dollars in his pocket. He settled here and started a small blacksmith shop right at the corner of Henry and Elm Street. And in a few years, partnered with Adam Dillman and started a small brewery. Now, it turns out Christian was a very good brewery. He made really good beer. So that was in 1853. In a year, he moved on a new partnership with Conrad Vindish. A couple years later, went out totally on his own and grew his brewery to be not only the biggest in the city of Cincinnati, the biggest in the state of Ohio, but at one point in time, the fifth biggest brewery in the country was Christian Moorline right in the heart of Over the Rhine, the brewery district. Um, they continued through Prohibition, uh, but decided to not reopen after Prohibition. The family uh, was doing well enough with all the real estate investments and other things and never reopened. This is where it gets a little confusing. You need a map again. Uh, the Hootapult Brewing Company in 1981 brought back the name Christian Moorline as the flagship of their new beer. It's actually one of the first craft beers in America. At the time, it was known as the Better Beer Movement. Uh, Anchor Steam uh, out in San Francisco was the first. Hootapult was basically the second craft beer in America in 1981. Um, they brought that name back, and, and, and that's been produced again all the way since 1981 by Hudebolt Shaling. And again, now a new Christian Moorline Brewing Company formed to buy Hudebolt Shaling in, in the early night or in the early 2000s, but it's been continuously made uh, since then, and, and continuing that trend, or I'm sorry, that ownership on. But there's still some amazing pieces of this complex left. If you've ever been to the Rheingeist Brewery, they're actually located in the Moorline Brewery Bottling Works. So that top right photo, the right building there. Uh, the left building is a barrel house. They're actually just about to open a restaurant in that first floor. The bottom right photo is the massive brew house. Um, that unfortunately does not stand, but uh, you can see the, these photos are a great example of the next round of brewery architecture. And this is, uh, we call it early lager period. And this is when breweries started to become really important in the city's economy uh, and, and what they were doing. And so you start to really see a, a separation in the design of these, that they took their own styling cues from the breweries back in Germany. And so you start to see uh, this very Romanesque detailing with a lot of arched windows and double and triple windows and the arch or the, the rounded eyebrow windows and arches in the brick and articulated brick cornices. You'll see this in a couple other buildings. So they're really starting to separate themselves. Like, hey, we're, we're a brewery here. We're going to own that. A lot of other parts of these breweries, not just the brew houses and bottling works, the stock house on the left, also known as the ice house, uh, basically vertical lagering cellars. The malt house on the top right, bigger breweries would actually make their own malt from the barley. Uh, again, the bottling works on the bottom right, that's where Rheingeist is now. Uh, again, that was a little later, so you see a little bit different architectural styling. Another great example of that early lager period is the Jackson Brewery. This is right at the head of Main Street, right at McMicken. So if you're at Philly Market on the Elm Street side, you can look straight up and, and see this brewery. Again, you can see that same kind of detail. Uh, early, uh, the, this is actually one of the earliest brewing sites in Cincinnati from about the 1830s. This particular structure wasn't built until the 1850s. 
This is a great example of using the hillside in the National Train to create logging cellars. And so uh, you'll see some other images here, some bottling works. This is one of the few that did reopen after Prohibition, so it's a little later uh, that they uh, opened the new bottling works after Prohibition. This old image, you can kind of see how this whole complex was sit up on a hill. That's McMakin down below. There's about 30, 40 feet of elevation up to Mohawk Street where the actual brew house sits. And underneath that brewery is a massive series of cellars, stone cellars underground. So the thing about lager beer is it's a different type of yeast. And so it, it takes a different process than ale to make. It requires a colder temperature to ferment and brew. That, that yeast will go dormant if it's too warm. And so it needs to stay about uh, 40, 45 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which in the uh, 1850s, you didn't have mechanical refrigeration. You just throw it in your fridge or in your ice chest. They actually would have to harvest ice at winter time and basically use caves, or in this case, man-made caves deep in the hillside or deep underneath buildings to keep that beer cold and pack that ice in. And so they could literally only make beer uh, in late winter and early springtime. By the middle of summer, they'd be out of ice to be too warm. So you literally would have to make an entire summer's worth of beer at once and store it away. And so there's these massive series of cellars uh, all throughout um, not only this brewery, but a lot of other breweries. I'll show you some other images as we go. Uh, it was a really intensive process, obviously, to make all that beer and store it. Uh, and it was a very tough way to be a brewer. You could literally drink a brewery dry if it was uh, a very hot, dry summer. This is another massive brewery, uh, the uh, Hauk Brewery. You may know the Hauk name still today. Uh, they're still around and have given a lot to the city. Um, it was later known as the Red Top Brewery after Prohibition. Their massive brewery stood over on Dayton Street. Um, most of that is gone, but you may have heard of the, the Hauk House, one of the mansions over on uh, Dayton Street, Cincinnati's Millionaire's Row. There's still some uh, great uh, pieces there. Again, this is a, another typical story uh, of how these brewers are very important in the city. Um, uh, John Houck, the brewer, uh, he gave back in a lot of different ways. And so uh, they helped a lot of different, uh, they helped new immigrants coming with, with jobs and, and support. They helped their churches. They sat on city boards and, and commissions and, and were very much important pillars of their community. Uh, he actually even bought the Reds for a, a period of time when they were insolvent to help keep them afloat, installed his son, Lewis, as the, the club president for a few years. Uh, and so the, these guys uh, were very much important parts of their communities. So this is another brewery, the, the Kaufman Brewery. This is right on Vine Street, right across from St. Francis Seraph Church. Um, and again, you start to see uh, as the, these buildings mature, they go into a, a different type of style that we call the mature lager period. Um, and they actually have architectural details of brewing and the brewing process and the ingredients in the architecture. And so in the freeze work, you actually see hops and hop leaves and different details uh, throughout there. Uh, again, they were really celebrating. These were huge pieces of the local economy and culture. And so they were celebrating that in so many different ways. Again, this is another great example of how these complexes were really spread out through the city. Uh, at the bottom left is in the main brew house. They had their own tap room across the alley. Across Hamer Street was their malt house and ice machines and barrel sheds. Up the street was their bottling works and wagon sheds. So you can just imagine having a big active brewery and having to take your product down public streets and back and forth and, and everything. And so again, when they had the opportunity to connect it via tunnels, they did. And so this is another great example. They, uh, this is on the flat part of, uh, of Cincinnati, and so there's no hill to dig into. They basically went straight down about 30 feet underground and dug these massive cellars underneath the street and underneath both the malt house and the brew house and connected via tunnel. Uh, these are photos from a few years ago. We've continued to clean up these cellars. We actually, uh, it, it's, it's only in Over the Rhine that you can have these stories. And so this cellar was actually rediscovered about 10, 15 years ago. And the owner of the building had a nice big basement, uh, bought the building, great, got this nice big basement. A couple years later, his realtor found some drawings in, in the photos and, and it indicated there was something else underneath there. And so like any good uh, building owner, started punching some holes and discovered, oops, 
uh, the, the top right there, about 15,000 square feet of massive cellars underneath his building. He had no idea he, they were there uh, when he purchased those, and that's pretty typical. There are so many of these cellars and spaces that have been abandoned over time. Um, Prohibition was a big part of that. M many of these breweries closed and never reopened. Uh, with mechanical refrigeration, a lot of these cellars became obsolete. So even before the breweries closed, they basically used them as giant trash pits and sealed them up. Some of these brewery buildings have been actually knocked down, and there's still cellars underneath the parking lot because 30, 40 feet deep, they didn't have the effort to go through and fill them up, and they supported literally tons and tons of beer on top of them so they could hold a few cars. And so we're literally still rediscovering some of these uh, cellar spaces even today. This is kind of the pinnacle architecturally of, of Cincinnati breweries. This is, uh, a, again, a couple different names, uh, Cliffside, the Sone Brewing Company, uh, you might know as Red Top. They actually brewed beer here up until 1957. Uh, very ornate. This, the, the main structure here was built in 1887 at that peak of that um, early lager, I'm sorry, mature lager period. And again, they really celebrated what they were doing. So you see the big cupola on top. Functionally, that allowed light and ventilation into the building. Uh, but you see the brewer star on the brewery. You see this great frieze with uh, cherubs and goblets of beer and the tools of the brewing trade and barrels of beer. Um, again, they were showcasing what they were doing. Even on the inside, there are beer barrel handrails, a newel post in there. Uh, they took those architectural elements all the way through. You can see a little bit better of that freeze. So there's some uh, great examples, again, of, of just celebrating what they were doing. Uh, all the, even the cast iron and those pieces were, were decorative. Um, and this building's really great. There's still some of the uh, grain bins and pulleys and stuff still there uh, that have just been sat dormant and vacant for a very long time. Uh, actually, this brewery, this building is, is slated to become a new brewery and event center here in the next couple years. So uh, our, our story's changing quite dramatically. Even a few years ago, these buildings were just vacant and not being used for anything. And now people are really starting to see the potential in reusing these. But as every good story uh, uh, has to have an end, so is prohibition. Uh, caused the end of, uh, or at least the, the temporary end of beer brewing in Cincinnati. And there were a lot of causes to prohibition. There was, you can go back and forth between um, immigrants and nativists and, and rural and city and uh, religious things and a lot of different aspects. But what it came down to is that the alcohol was basically made illegal. And in a city like Cincinnati, where beer was such an integral part of the culture and economy and customs, again, all those Germans, they were drinking that beer as a, as a way, you know, as part of their uh, culture and fellowship. Now, of course, like everything, there's abuses of that. But it was, a, it was an important part of their culture. On your one day off a week, you were now not allowed to go have a beer with your friends in the beer garden or down at the saloon. And so not only economically did we lose all those thousands of brewery jobs, but all these supporting industries, the, the barrel makers, the, 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 uh, the, the delivery drivers, the, all the equipment that you needed to make and serve beer uh, was all made here. So it was a huge uh, loss uh, financially, again, but more important, culturally. Now, uh, you know, uh, again, the workers didn't help. Uh, breweries tried to get by. Uh, they would make root beer. They would make non-alcoholic beer, but nobody was drinking 40 gallons of root beer or non-alcoholic beer a year to make it through. And so most of Cincinnati's breweries closed. Um, only a handful uh, stayed open, uh, again, making a near beer or doing something similar or just kind of limping by. Um, on top of that, we also had this little thing called World War I that, again, was another part of that prohibition story. And so not only did you lose your chance to drink a beer with friends, now your entire ethnicity and culture was suspect. And so in Cincinnati, again, we basically jettisoned all of our heritage. We, we pushed aside our German heritage and culture and you know hit it and change names and close things and stop teaching German and all this stuff and, and really pushed that entire identity behind us. In conjunction with that, in that time period, we were starting to see a move out to the suburbs, even the first suburbs, you know, Clifton and Price Hill, um, getting out of that dirty, smoggy, smelly city basin. And so this huge, all these factors came together that started to empty out a neighborhood of all of its important things, people and ideas and, and the history. 
And again, that's exactly what prohibition did. It, it started that process. So, you know, it was a neighborhood of 44,000 people with businesses and an industry and everything all there. Uh, and it started to decline from, from that period onward. So over the years, there was, uh, you know, the brewing industry came back after Prohibition ended in 1933. Uh, we had, uh, again, I mentioned there was about, uh, there were four breweries that reopened under the original ownership, uh, Foss Schneider, uh, Hudepol, uh, Wiedemann in here in Northern Kentucky, and Schaller, and it was only one Cincinnati brewery that was still making near beer that could ramp up production right away. That was the Bruckman Brewery over in Northside. And so, uh, but very quickly, some of these breweries reopened. Some had new owners in old breweries, and so Red Top opened in Halk. You may have heard of the Burger Brewing Company. They were Maltzers before Prohibition. They opened in the old Lion Vintage Mulhauser Brewery. Uh, but so times were good again for a while. But uh, by 1973, we were down to three local breweries, and there were a couple different factors. Um, the, the biggest is we are kind of victims of our own success. Before Prohibition, we drank so much beer here, most of the breweries didn't have to sell their beer anywhere else to be successful. We were also linked to the canals and not the railroads. And so the breweries in Milwaukee and St. Louis that took advantage of being on the rail lines and took advantage of maybe not being in smaller cities and not selling as much beer locally and, and selling their name more uh, made them much more predisposed to be successful after Prohibition. Most of the breweries in Cincinnati were trying to reopen in these old, tight, urban breweries that weren't very productive. Um, and so all those factors came back and made it very hard for Cincinnati breweries to compete. And as that wave continued, national breweries started buying out local breweries. And again, by 1973, we were down to three. And by the late 90s, we were down to zero locally owned breweries. We still had the Shaneling Brewery that was being that was now owned by the Boston Beer Company, Sam Adams, a couple of microbreweries, but basically uh, no locally owned breweries left in Cincinnati. However, we were are still left with this amazing collection of brewery architecture in the middle of an amazing urban historic neighborhood like over the Rhine in the West End. So that's where we come in, among many other people. So we were formed uh, a little over 10 years ago, about 12 years ago, um, to focus on our area of the neighborhood in Over the Rhine, uh, that area north of Lurie Street. Um, residents, business owners, stakeholders, to what we could do to make our neighborhood better. It was a pretty empty neighborhood. Over the Rhine had gotten down about 5,000 people living in it. 44,000 to 5,000. It had been a victim to a lot of crime, a lot of other misjudgments over the years. And so uh, there was a lot of not of great things happening in the neighborhood. But um, we started to look and see what we could do. And so we did a lot of things. We, we started by drinking some beer and coming up with some ideas and, and a lot of grassroots stuff. We started doing tours of the old breweries back in 2006, um, showing people the his, this history. And we very quickly realized what an asset we had. People would take... Uh, pay us money to take a tour of an old building because it has this brewing history and go in these lagering cellars. Heritage events. Uh, has anybody ever been to Bachfest before? All right. Well, you all you need to be, all of you are invited next year. The, next year will be the 26th Bachfest. It's a celebration of Bach beer, Cincinnati's brewing heritage, and the coming of spring. It's the first weekend in March. It starts off with the best parade in Cincinnati. It's a hoot. There's beer, there's sausage queens, there's a 5K. It's a blast. Just just come and check it out. But it's a it's a way to celebrate the neighborhood and, and bring people out. Fundraising, we work with Finley Market and do a lot of other events, other promotional events uh, with brewery collectors and different things. Some very early uh, signage projects, uh, documentation, finding uh, these old resources and preserving them. We've been working with uh, the uh, Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library on a project to to find and archive a lot of, uh, and scan for preservation, a lot of brewing heritage assets. We've partnered with some documentaries. Preservation, we literally have dug out some of these cellars and made them accessible for people to see them. Neighborhood cleanups, things like that. Uh, design uh, neighborhood charrettes and different design projects and idea generation. Uh, master planning to, to figure out and drive what we see that needs to happen in this neighborhood so we can help make it a, a neighborhood for to live, work, and play and repopulate it sustainably. And so our master plan in 2011, we had eight different initiatives that we came up with. We sat down with a huge group of folks, stakeholders, and people have done projects all across the, the country and locally and came up with 
with eight different ideas to, to help drive redevelopment. And some of that's very basic stuff, working on complete streets for pedestrians and zoning projects and historic districts and uh, recreation facilities. But our signature project is the Brewing Heritage Trail. And this has uh, been in works in various ways since 2011, but this is going to be a world-class urban heritage trail that celebrates our unique history and uses it as an economic development tool. So you may know the, the Freedom Trail in Boston, the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky, you know, almost any other big city has heritage trails, the, a lot of them in D.C. No city has the brewing history that we have in a, in a neighborhood like we have, and it's an asset that we have to, that we need to promote. So it's sharing our stories, and it's not just how much beer we made and how much we drank. I just barely touched on some of these things. The, the interesting thing about beer in Cincinnati is you can really tie it to almost every aspect of Cincinnati and America's history. Um, you know, all those things, immigration, ingenuity, conflict, ethnic conflict, industrialization, labor struggle, all that stuff, medicine, all these things told through the lens of beer. Beer touched every aspect of the city's history. And so we're telling all those stories through beer. It's these assets, all those brewery buildings that I showed you and more, uh, this amazing collection of architecture. It's really unparalleled. We have what we believe is the largest collection of pre-prohibition brewery architecture in the country. Again, all in a pretty dense neighborhood. <clears throat> Bring visitors, again, that economic development tool. Uh, other cities, Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, Boston, people go there for the history and the culture and it's an economic development asset. We have that capability and potential here in the city. We have not capitalized on that in a lot of different ways. And we're starting to, you know, region-wise, realize that we have this amazing history that's, that's an asset. We're, we're getting back there, but the Heritage Trail is going to be a big way to do that. Again, driving that development, filling those empty buildings, filling empty lots, helping new businesses bring, you know, bring visitors to those businesses to spend dollars. And so <clears throat> the trail at its heart... Um, the, this is our initial vision. Uh, it's about a 2.3 mile route. Starts across the street from the casino, up through Pendleton, up through Main Street, so I'm following the blue line there. Up McMicken, down Vine, uh, over to Finley Market on the orange line, all the way up to West McMicken and Mohawk and back. That's our initial vision, about 2.3 miles. The dashed yellow lines are where we could extend in the future, be live virtually now, and it's all connected via the streetcar down to where the other the folks are coming down uh, and make it visitor friendly. And so the trail is a lot of different components. We we researched a lot of projects across the country, brought in people who have done different aspects of this all across the country. And nobody's kind of combining all the elements that we have in one comprehensive uh, trail. So it starts with wayfinding in the bronze medallions. Very traditional. If you've been to Boston, you've seen the bronze medallions in the sidewalk. We don't have quite the budget for the brick line, but we've, we've got the medallions that are going to lead you through the streets. Signage that tells you where to start, give you the map. These kind of hop-on points at key visitor locations. And the actual signage that sits uh, out on the sidewalk in front of these buildings. And so every brewery's marked, different story points are marked. So it's a modern take. It's not your standard, just kind of bronze historic marker. It's a modern take, very industrial with some piping, uh, a lot of graphics, a lot of photos, a lot of images. And uh, we can tell a lot of different stories with that. Where we have some more room, we do different uh, barrels, uh, kind of half barrels, vertical or uh, horizontal pieces. Um, every single building that is a brewery structure is marked with a sign. So there's no comprehensive marker saying, hey, this brewery, this was a stock house for this brewery. We're doing that with the Heritage Trail. So that's the physical piece. That's the traditional piece. The digital trail is just as important. So you can only fit so many stories on a physical sign. You can't change them. That's where your smartphone app comes in. We can have basically an unlimited number of stories as we tell all these different aspects. People can do self-guided tours and in, in different aspects of that, of that. So whether you come on a tour, you, uh, you, you, you take the guided tour, and you, you, know, you want to learn more, you always have that there. We basically are building a library of all these different stories that you can learn about. That lets you guide you through the neighborhood. One of the things that we're really excited about is that we can also do digital experiences. So we do guided tours and taking those sellers, but they're not always accessible or there's buildings that have been torn down that aren't there anymore. So we can use the technology holding your smartphone and recreate those or actually take x-ray underground and see those sellers underneath your feet or 
you know, recreate a building that's been long gone and use that as a whole nother level of interpretive storytelling. Public art is another piece that we're, we've uh, partnered on almost a dozen public art pieces from big, huge murals to little smaller ones, mosaics and neon and different things, uh, along with some of the other breweries. Sam Adams has done one, Ryan Geist has done one, Moreline's done a couple. And so it's another interpretive piece that we get to deal with, or uh, get to use to, to tell the story. We've already started. Uh, if you've been to the ballpark in the last couple years, you might have seen our kind of prototype kiosks there that tell some of those stories, uh, how beer saved baseball, how Cincinnati brewers were really fighting the good fight for beer quality against other, uh, other, um, uh, other cities like Milwaukee and, and St. Louis. And so we're continuing to work on this. We actually are just, uh, uh, the, the website is launched. We're in the soft launch right now, the smartphone app. That you should uh, see an announcement in the next month or two on the app. There'll be a free app that you can download and, and check things out. And we're actually building the first three quarter mile segment of the trail. It's, uh, we're actually under contract. Um, it's gonna be fabricated and installed over the fall and winter here uh, to launch early next spring. Uh, and so we're really excited about that. So this is actually coming to fruition. So this is actually our first segment, highlights the Crown Brewery and that Kaufman Brewery and the original Hooterbolt Brewery connects over to Finley Market. So uh, in a year's time, you'll be actually, actually about half a year's time, you'll be able to walk along the first part of this trail. So that's what we're doing. Um, there's a lot, you know, I just, briefly touched on, on the history here. Uh, these are some really excellent books if you want to read more. Um, Over the Rhine When Beer Was King, Michael Morgan. He's actually our trail curator and actually researching and doing a lot of our research and, and writing. Uh, Tim Holian's Over the Barrel, Volume 1s and 2 are really a comprehensive look. Volume 1 is pre-prohibition, Volume 2 is post-prohibition. Amazing collection of, of history there. Uh, William Downard's book, uh, Brewing Industry, Bob uh, Wimberg's book, Cincinnati Breweries, uh, Don Tolzman has a number of books over on Tour Guide. He just released a book on John Houck. He's got one on Christian Moorline. So uh, even with the, the, the history and the scholarship, we're starting to see a lot more resurgence in, in, um, in this history and, and how it's tied to everything. So those are our websites, um, but I'll go ahead and open it up to questions now. Uh, in terms of having a favorite beer, it's um, I'm in a lucky position. We get to work with a lot of local breweries, and so um, it's always changing. I think so. Uh, what I'll, I'll give the politically correct answer, and a good locally produced beer is uh, the one. And you can't even keep up with the local breweries these days. And that's a really great thing about what we're doing is that we are not a beer trail. Every other city now has a beer trail or an ale trail that highlights all the local breweries. Fantastic. We, we have lots of awesome breweries here. No other city has a brewing heritage trail that makes that connection both past and present with the brew. And so it's a very powerful thing that we have here that you can walk along, see this history, experience it, and then walk into a bar or an actual brewery in an old brewery and have a beer again that's made locally. So it, it's a great thing to have uh, that, that partnership. And so, uh, yes. Yeah, the, the number of breweries today is actually, I believe, depending on what you define as your range of what Greater Cincinnati is, is almost equal to the peak. Now, the, the big key there is that volume-wise, most of these new breweries are doing under 1,000 barrels of beer a year. So they're, they're pretty small in the scheme of things. So sheer number, they're right about back there. Total volume, not quite yet. So uh, if you, you know, if you, even including the Sam Adams brewery here, which is one of their biggest production facilities, we're still not anywhere near the, the total output of back in the day. But yeah, sheer number. The great thing that we're seeing too is that there's only going to be so many of the Rheingeist or the Moorlines or the Mad Trees. We're starting to see a lot of these neighborhood breweries. So they're, they're, they're not trying to be the, the, the biggest and best and trying to take a, you know, 10 feet of space on Kroger shelves. They're, they're, they're content to be a great local beer in their neighborhood and serve those neighborhoods and, and being those third places again. And that's, I think, a great thing about 
reflecting on Cincinnati beer history is that it was a facilitator of all those things. It was, it wasn't going out just to get drunk. People did that, but it facilitated the social life, the cultural life, you know, politics, business, you know, the Stamish table, the, the regulars table, savings and loans kind of originated from the saloons and the saloon keeper holding everybody's money and insurance companies from kind of the neighbors pulling together and kind of buying in that beer facilitated all those different parts of the culture. And we're starting to kind of see that again with all these little local breweries. Economic wise now, how has, how has like the craft industry impacted like So from my understanding, they, uh, that the, the, the craft beer industry, they've been growing their, um, market share over the years and, and chipping away at the big uh, breweries, but the, the big ones keep buying craft brewers. So it's kind of a big back and forth right now. And, you know, I think the, the trend is getting a little more level from what I read. Uh, that's not having that exponential growth. I think that's where you're seeing it's all these little local breweries. And so they're, you know, somebody that opens, you know, they're going to brew a thousand barrels of beer a year, which is what you know, Miller spills on their floor a year, you know, so you're, there's only going to be so many of these big new breweries opening like a Rheingeist or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. But it could be like just cyclical type thing. Maybe it's so big and then all of a sudden everybody gets smaller. It, the, like anything, there'll probably be a correction at some point. But I, I think the smart ones, the ones that are, again, setting themselves up to be those local places are going to be a much different place. They're also just don't have the you know, uh, capital investment of a big, huge brewery, you know. So if you don't have a big canning line and a bottling line, that's a whole lot less that you have to, to worry about. How far could these breweries ship the beer back then? If there was a guy in Nashville or New York who wanted to have his Cincinnati brewed beer, can he get it? He could. And actually, so – it wasn't necessarily easy. You know, we were connected via the canal early on, later on by some of the railroads. Uh, so you could ship beer. Lager beer was much harder to ship uh, because it needed to stay cold. Um, but Cincinnati beer was actually shipped around the country and around the globe. More Lines beer was popular in South America and Europe. And so it was possible to send it. Again, it wasn't necessarily cheap, but again, Cincinnati beer was so good. We, were, we had such good brewers. It was this well-known commodity. Um, you would often see partnerships where they would ship the beer in bulk and then bottle it at different places. So Moreline had a partnership with the Gerst Brewery in Nashville. So you'll sometimes see Moreline Gerst down there or see bottling operations in Pittsburgh or different places east. So they would kind of ship it in bigger vats versus shipping a whole bunch of bottles, also more economically feasible. So they did try to do what they could. But really, Moreline was the biggest one that had that national presence. And the fact that they chose not to reopen after Prohibition was one of the reasons why Cincinnati Brewery never became a, you know, a Miller or a Coors or, a, you know, a, a Milwaukee Brewery. That they were one of the few that had a national name and could have capitalized on that, uh, but chose not to. Most of the other breweries that reopened in Cincinnati were just regional breweries and didn't have a national name. Beer, yeah, yeah. So, so beer is a little different. So that that making the mash is kind of a very simple, similar process in terms of cooking the the grains and that stuff. But beer, by its nature, um, uh, tended to be a little bit more uniform. Now, early on, it, it was always rudimentary. Again, you're chilling things with ice. You're probably going to have a little bit of variation now and then. And that's where these guys were were very skilled in the fact that they could keep that quality so tight under that maybe less than perfect condition. Uh, you know, th when they would store the beer, they usually brew big vats of it and only barrel it for storage. The barrel really wouldn't meant, uh, wasn't meant to impart any flavor in, in beer, so it's a very neutral. So the barrel is really just a storage mechanism. So uh, as long as they made it right and kept it, you know, clean and, and cool, usually that didn't affect the flavor like you do with a, with a whiskey or something like that. Basically, yes. Yeah, all brew starts with um, 
uh, taking uh, the grains, usually barley, um, that they, they uh, uh, make malt with. Uh, the malting process is you, you basically take the, the, the barley or whatever grain you're doing, uh, soak it, allow it to germinate a little bit, start to sprout uh, over a, a malting floor. Then you take it to a kiln and dry it and stop that process. You crack it, throw it in boiling water, and all those starches and everything that, that come out of that uh, becomes the, the, the wort. You send that through, that's basically what you add the yeast to, um, and that's what starts the process. The yeast eats that, the, the sugars in there and creates alcohol. Now, within there, yeah, the, the different malts, how long you cook it, um, what type of hops you use. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to add hops in there as well. That's kind of an important part of beer. Uh, uh, the yeast you use, that's, again, the most critical. You basically have two base yeast, either ale yeast or lager yeast, but even within that, there's a lot of variation, how much you use. So, uh, you know, just like any kind of craft thing, it's amazing the, that very kind of base level of ingredients, the varieties that you can get out of that. I don't think so. We've actually seen an OTR about uh, two new wineries open. So um, I, I think what you're seeing, uh, at least in my opinion, is you're, you're seeing whatever people are drinking, they're appreciating something made locally and by somebody they can meet and talk to. So even spirits, you're starting to see a lot more, you know, distilled spirits made locally that you can, you know where it's made, you know who made it and can talk to the guy or girl who made that. And so I think whatever it is that's where you're seeing the biggest growth is that that local um, versus buying something that's mass produced you can get the same thing on either end of the country that local thing that you can only get here people really appreciate that and you know again that's in one sense economically more healthy all those dollars stay in the in the city and in the region much more than being shipped off somewhere and so it's it's a it's a good thing from a regional standpoint as well so has anybody ever done any of the, 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 the tours uh, through this? So we offer tours um, all year long. Um, you can go to our websites, check those out. Actually, I forgot to bring flyers. I apologize. Um, it's a great way to see the neighborhood. Come down to Over the Rhine, stop at Philly Market, have some food there. It, if you haven't been to Over the Rhine in a few years, you need to check it out. It's an amazing transformation. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for 18 years. It blows me away every day when I'm walking down the street and I see a new project being redeveloped. Um, we still have a long way to go, but people, again, have really appreciated what we have there and are seeing the value in that. And so it's great to see a lot of these buildings repopulated, being filled with residents and businesses and restaurants and bars and everything. And basically taking the neighborhood back to how it was built. It was built as a true mixed-use neighborhood where you walked everywhere, and you, you lived, worked, and played all in the same neighborhood. That's how the neighborhood's best to be redeveloped, and that's what's happening. So it's, it's, it's really great to see. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to bring alcohol into a library, so...